Hello. Welcome to our next hour together here where I will be covering the most common neurologic disorders in French Bulldogs and then obviously we'll make um, quite a bit of room in the end to cover questions which come up through my talk obviously. So I'm Dr. Fitz, I'm one of the neurologists here at Southeast Veterinary Neurology. So first of all I wanted to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm born in Germany and I came obviously um, over here to be a neurologist um, as I guess you guys know. So um, I always wanted to be a vet and this is why I pursued that passion and um, became a vet. And then neurology is my deep passion and my love is deeply for animals. So I combined those two and found a perfect profession for myself. So this is why I'm a veterinary neurologist. But why do I love Frenchies in particular so much? Because they're funny, they're adorable, they're, they're affectionate, you know, they're they are loyal, they just want to cheer you up and make you happy and they're just amazing little dogs. So this is why today I want to dedicate this hour to just talking about Frenchies. This video I think is a little bit self-explanatory. Whoever has a French at home, they know this is exactly how they are. They're energetic, they jump, they play, they just mean it well and this I think says it all how those two um, little guys play with each other so happily. Just let you watch that. Makes me giggle every time I see them being in so much energy here. So but obviously it's not just me who loves them. It, in general, the French Bulldog has increased in their popularity in the recent years and more and more people own French Bulldogs. So this is why I wanna raise awareness also on what actually can happen to them that people get also uh, ready for, for you know, when they adopt a French Bulldog. So we breed them to have those short little cute skulls and we breed them to have shorter backs and shorter legs. We call it a brachycephalic and a chondrodystrophic body conformation. And believe it or not, but out of five French Bulldogs, which do present to a veterinarian, one out of the five have actually a neurologic problem. So this is a quite significant uh, number. This is why we're meeting here today. So what I wanna do in the next half an hour to go over the most common symptoms to look out at home. So for you um, dog owners at home, to look out for what, how does my Frenchie display that has spinal cord problems? What are the common symptoms for brain problems? How do we diagnose and treat them? And then obviously we'll draw some summary conclusion. And then as I promised, we'll make some room in time to answer some questions you for sure will have. So every time I face a neurologic dog or a, a, a patient which comes here to see me, I build that little tree. So that's a very nice exercise to do is first of all, answer the STEM question. Is the problem neurologic in origin or not? So obviously once we answered, yes, you're absolutely here, ride with me, the dog has a neurologic problem, we then need to differentiate, is it spinal cord, is it a brain, or is it the peripheral neuropathy, so nerves and muscles. So we'll first focus on spinal cord problems because more Frenchies have spinal cord than brain problems, but obviously um, it's not as simple as that, but we'll first uh, focus on spinal cord problems. So here I wanna show you a video of uh, a Frenchie, which um, obviously relatively mildly affected, but you can see how he, he just uh, missed a little step and has a little bit of, a, of an odd gait in both of his back limbs. We can watch it once more. If you wanna draw close attention just through to his rear limbs. Here he's stumbling, here he stumbled for a second. We call this an ataxia because he, he lost his awareness for his limbs. Obviously he's not severely affected, but definitely not normal. And then this is another Frenchie, now much more severely affected. His front limbs are normal and he's walking himself pretty well, but the rear end is paralyzed. So he needs the support of my nurse here holding him, him up and he just slips and slides both of his back legs. This is another Frenchie in his, in, in this case, actually, you can see none of the four limbs now move. So we have slings in the front and in the back, and none of the limbs can move. Um, so he's completely paralyzed from his uh, neck on downwards. This little video shows that 
we encouraged him, you know, one might say, is it a sling that make him not want to participate in work, but even if left alone and if, if encouraged with treats and sweet calling, he, he can't move, like he's trying, but he can't. So he's paralyzed from his neck on, on downwards. So those are just three example videos of what common problems which can present like that. So whenever we have a dog presenting with a problem suspe suspicious to be affecting the spinal cord, the neck or the back, we ask those questions of how severe it is. So we determine it is the spinal cord. The next question is where in the spinal cord? So can you move not all four limbs or can you move just not the rear limbs? And then uh, the next step is to determine how severe is that, is that Frenchie effect. So we usually categorize this in a category scale of one through five. One is the best and five is the worst. So here's the scaling actually in the little bullet points. One meaning, the dog has back or neck pain, but is able to walk uh, freely and normally, has no deficits. You will only recognize the pain when you actually palpate the animal on the neck or on the back where it is uh, painful respectively. Two is then a weak and wobbly gait, but the animal is able to walk. So that was the first video we watched. Obviously he was able to walk, but he was a little bit wobbly in, in his rear end. Three is too weak to walk, but with support, there is motor function. So this was the attempt we did in trying to lift him up in the rear end to see is they still able to, um, to move his, both of his back limbs. But the second video, he actually was not. So the second video is then a category four. This Frenchie was completely paralyzed from the waist on downwards, but he could still feel his limbs. And the same ac uh, accounted actually for the last video we watched. He was completely paralyzed but from the neck on downwards. So all four limbs were affected. That's category four. Category five is the worst category, meaning um, those Frenchies are paralyzed and they lost the ability to feel their limbs. So it's unfortunate, obviously, the, the worst category, and this is a, an emergency uh, situation where we need to interfere like immediately. So kind of, and then we arrive at the differential list point. So kind of to recap, Step one is, is it neurologic? Step two is, it is it in the spinal cord? Where in the spinal cord, in the neck or in the back? And then the third question is, how severe is it on the scale of one through five? So we determine all those steps. So this is the next question of what actually can happen or what causes this French bulldog in particular to be so affected. And I made here a list of eight points with the first four are highlighted or like are in, in larger letters because they are the more common ones. So intervertebral disc disease, hands down the most common injury for a French bulldog. We call it also colloquially the slip disc or herniated disc um, or rupture disc. These are all similar words for the same problem. The disc where it is meant to sit between two vertebras is actually slipping out and causing a compressive spinal cord um, injury to the spinal cord at that very specific spot. Sprenches can also be um, having something what we call a subarachnoid diverticulum. So it's a cyst, it's a fluid pocket, which builds over, over time, basically, um, slowly and causes a compression from the top uh, onto the spinal cord. So it's a more slow, progressive, usually non-painful condition when it's very um, recognized in French bulldogs as well. This is usually associated with malformations, but malformations by themselves also exist, you know, with any other consequence. So malformations together with the disc and together with the diverticulum, but by itself is a very, very common um, condition in Frenchies. They have just vertebrae that are less well-formed or are differently formed um, than they're anatomically meant to be formed. And then the fourth category is inflammation, so meningitis which usually 95% is actually autoimmune in origin, meaning an immune mediated condition rather than an infection. So cancer, strokes, infections, fracture luxation, they are just listed there because obviously we can never exclude any of those things and, and we obviously have seen any Frenchie can have any condition, but the first four are the more common ones. So how do we identify or how do we differentiate which of those eight things we've listed is actually the problem. So part of it is obviously 
the evaluation by us. So important to identify, is it neurologic or is it orthopedic? You know, is it having a weakness in the limbs because he tore a cruciate? Where in the spinal cord is the problem coming from? How severe it is? Um, so that's a very important first step. And then also based on history, the signalment, so the age and the grade, obviously we make a differential list, which makes the most educated guess sense. The second step is to get ready for advanced imaging, meaning we need some minimum database, fresh blood work, chest x-rays. This is mainly to assure that this uh, particular patient is, un is able to undergo um, anesthesia to perform an MRI scan. And then the MRI is performed of the actual neuroanatomic localization. So usually we, you can scan an entire dog and also we need to identify where's the clinical problem coming from and correlate that with our imaging findings. So that's why it's very important. We are very thorough and we go stepwise and don't skip any of those steps along the way. And here are just some sample pictures of our MRI suite, for example, of the computer, how we read MRIs and obviously doing an exam. I always do all my exams on the floor because I feel like French just don't want to be on the table on the spot and they just chill out and mingle with me better when we hang out on the floor for some while. And then treatment options vary. So while some conditions like, for example, a sudden ruptured slip disc needs emergency surgery, other discs that are bulging and you know, are only minimal compressive, we may try medical management and if only if that fails, we consider surgery. Some things like um, autoimmune meningitis is treated with aggressive medication. So there are different, uh, different types of how we treat different conditions. And even within the conditions, different medication plans, um, obviously depending on the MRI study, we choose the most appropriate route and also have, have then a prognostic idea. So, and then the ultimate goal is actually that. So this uh, is a little Frenchie which had a hard time moving their back end. So you see, we give him again support. His limbs move a little bit, the rear limbs, but not very great. And if we would not support him, he would just collapse to the ground. And then this is two weeks later, you know, obviously super happy and back to the Frenchie personality of being all over the place and jumping and, and totally being excited being in our physical rehab room. So that's the whole goal of what we do is we get them up and walking again, we get their old personality back and we wanna restore their old quality of life. So that's the half point of uh, the presentation. So I just wanted to um, pause for a minute and give you all the option also to write down questions about spinal cord condition, how do we diagnose, how do we recognize and how do we, what do we do with those conditions? And obviously we'll come back to those questions in the end. So when we continue now, I wanna now focus a little bit more on brain conditions. We'll come back once more to that same tree. So again, if the dog is having any signs that suggest of a brain problem, we first evaluate, is it neurologic or not? So things like ophthalmologic conditions, other things can, can look like brain problems, systemic diseases, metabolic diseases. So that's a, that my first job is to identify, yes, it is neurologic in origin. The brain is the problem. And then we again make it the franchise. So it's always the same tree type of approach. So I want to show you some videos. This is a Frenchie, has a head tremor. He tremors left and right. And he obviously persistently continues to do so. What you can't hear in that video is the owner's calling him out. And uh, pets him. And this actually stopped the tremor. So those are questions that we will ask, you know, when you bring the little Frenchie like that, I looked at him, you know, gave my first uh, impression, and then we will ask question, can you distract him or not? Is he losing consciousness or not? Can he see during the question? And all of those things can help me to further identify um, what might be the, the problem. So those are two additional videos. In the upper video, there is what we call an nystagmus. So the eyes are flicking diagonally from, from up to down. It's called an nystagmus, and it's happening in both eyes. And then he, this is another example video of uh, nystagmus. Perfect. So obviously what we get to do in our exam is 
we try to keep them as still and as quiet as possible, you know, to see that actually, if you, if you can notice in the beginning of the video, he's just looking around to see what's happening. And it's hard to appreciate that misdiagnosis. But once he, he calmed down, plays once more for you. Once he calmed down and he got less distracted with people moving around him and his head actually was really still, you could really appreciate how the eyes flick left and right and we determine the fast phase and the slow phase of that um, um, abnormal eye movement. This is actually a video of a, of a very young puppy. So besides obviously the very large head, you know, so the uh, dome shaped head. What I want to point out in that video is also the aimless wandering, he's just walking somewhere, wherever. Obviously the person who took the video should be the person of his uh, interest, but he clearly is not interested in that. He's just wandering off and then he has a little bit of a tendency to circle um, as you can know this year. So those are just things we, we look out for. So those are the common clinical signs to look out for. So I summarized them here for you. What are the common symptoms? Obviously a seizure, is a very dramatic convulsive event, which is very clear a problem affecting the brain. Circling is uh, usually when the animal has a compulsive nature of going in the same direction. Sometimes circling, they can change the direction, but meaning even if you put an obstacle in their way, the animal will find a way to just keep circling all the time into the same direction. Head pressing means that the, the dog is actually really pushing his head against the wall which uh, one might suggest that could be like headache type symptoms. Central vestibular signs, we saw that earlier with the funny eye movements left and right. Sometimes they have like a high stepping to their gait or when they walk, they're just off balance and they fall um, left and right and they're just not coordinated. Or they have a sway to themselves like back and forth, left and right, they just can't stand still. Um, and then behavior change. So that's actually a very com or very important point, I quite often see dogs where the presenting sign is actually behavior change. So mom and dad tell me he's just not himself. He's just different. He stares in the house. He's lost. He's not getting excited to go into the, in, to the backyard and so forth. So behavior change is a very common presenting complaint as well. So and then we have the same way with the, with the, with the spinal cord. So we identified, yes, it's part of the brain. Actually, what we can even do with a detailed hands-on neuro exam, we measure all our pathways, our reflexes, our responses. They have a little bit, a list of testings they have to go through. And with those tests, we can identify most often even where exactly in the brain is the problem coming from, which often can help to narrow down that differential list even further. And then we build that same list. So unfortunately, the, the two most common problems affecting the brain in a Frenchie is tumor, so in particular glioma, but other tumors are possible. The second common is inflammation. So again, the meningitis, similar to the spinal cord meningitis, it's just this time affecting the brain, so autoimmune rather than infection. They can have middle and inner ear infection, which can look like a brain problem or can even breach the, the little bone separating the mid middle inner ear from the brain, so it can cause an autogenic abscess. They can have epilepsy as the genetic uh, seizure condition. They can have hydrocephalus, like we saw in the little puppy there. Um, congenital deafness is also relatively common in Frenchies. And obviously the list keeps going on and on and on. So strokes, you know, for example, is, is a very common problem as well. And we have the same diagnose, diagnostic approach as we did for the spinal cord. So we want to identify, is it the brain, where in the brain, is it, um, should we do an MRI scan, you know, should we do medication trials? There are the same reasons to do our blood work and x-rays to make sure they can actually go into MRI, even more so because dogs with a problem in their brain, we need to be anesthetic wise, super careful, which we are. So this is one picture here is actually Anna, she's one of our anesthesia nurses. What we try to accomplish here is to be as safe as possible. So we are um, making sure that we have full monitoring on board. We you know, watch them very carefully, so our anesthetic um, risk is actually reduced to a minimum. 
And then the same treatment options exist. Some things can only be managed medically. Some things can be managed medically or surgical. We definitely, things like hydrocephalus can be shunted. Things like brain tumors can be biopsied. You know, so there are definitely conditions we can consider surgery. There are conditions where um, medical management is the better option. And obviously, depending on the, the, the definitive diagnosis, what exact medications do we need to treat? What kind of exact um, problem? So kind of to wrap that up a little bit, the spinal cord is more often affected than the brain by statistics. You know, the slip disc is by far the most common problem um, affecting a Frenchie. Inflammation, so the autoimmune meningitis is the second most common problem. And then unfortunately, things like tumors or malformations are commonly seen as well. So the most important take home message I think is once you see, okay, the friend, my dog is having a symptom which was described, we need to see a neurologist, we need to consider an MRI scan to differentiate the exact underlying cause and to develop the perfect treatment plan for best outcome. So, and I think we're moving on to some of the questions if, uh, mm -hmm. right. Perfect, so we have already some questions which came in before, so we just added them to the slides here and I will try my best to, to answer as many questions as possible. So. This question was asked if, uh, unfortunately, it's actually sad to read, but apparently this dog had a brain tumor and it passed uh, away. And the question is, can it happen because we weaned off the prednisone? So unfortunately, if a dog has a brain tumor, it depends obviously what type of tumor, but assuming it is a glioma, we often actually start dogs um, on steroids because it can reduce the swelling around the tumor temporarily. So it doesn't make the tumor go away. It's just the tumor grows inside the bony casing. So we have no extra room for the brain where it can basically go since we have the extra tissue of the tumor, meaning we create an inflammatory reaction of the brain tissue surrounding that bone. And this is what, uh, why prednisone is used. Unfortunately, prednisone is not a, a fix or a you know, curative uh, medication. It's just a temporary fix. And most often it's used as a weaning schedule because it only has an anti-inflammatory uh, function for a short period of time. And then we have to wean it off if we want to even try a second time around. But so unfortunately, I don't think it's because of the weaning of the prednisone, probably more li likely because of the progression of the brain tumor. But obviously um, only a repeated imaging of the brain would tell this definitively. And then the second question to that, um, or the second part of the question was, the initial neuroscience of the seizure never came back. Is that common? So I obviously don't know, but I, I'm under the assumption that um, the person who diagnosed the brain tumor also prescribed possible some anti-seizure medications, which usually is the goal to suppress the seizure activity, to get some phenobarbital or keprazonizamide, uh, potassium bromide there, so many anti-seizure medications out there to get those seizures under control, at least temporarily. Doesn't mean if the seizures stay away that the tumor is actually shrinking, it just means that the medication sufficiently helped to suppress those seizure activities. Hope this answers that question. So this is the next question, which um, um, he says that 80% of the breed has two copies of the IVDD gene. And uh, some of them still remain symptom-free while some can get those uh, problems. And what can we do to reduce their problems? So, so as we said, one in, uh, one in five Frenchies have a neurologic problem. And of those which do have a neurologic problem, we actually have uh, about maybe 60% actually have IVDD. So kind of by statistics, we can make our numbers out that how many Frenchies, you know, eventually will have IVDD as a or which will have IVDD and then a subsequent slip disc. So not every Frenchie with IVDD ever have a slip disc. Obviously having the degeneration of the disc makes it more likely that the disc ruptures out. What can we do to reduce the chances is actually avoiding high impact activities. I think it's staying lean, it's staying active, but in a low, active, uh, low impact activity. So rather going for walks, going for swims, you know, staying active, but the rough playing, the playing with the ball, jumping up, you know, up and down furniture, this usually maybe makes the chances a little bit higher. Um, most of the breeds have vertebral deformation of various types. That's actually very true. 
Um, and this is why it's very true. Some of them have the scoliosis and the, the different um, shapes of their backs. And actually, interestingly, once if we, let's say, would take every single Frenchie and take radiographs, I bet you 90% have this different shape, the uh, spinal cord, even that we may not be able to see that right from the outside, but most of them actually do. And we call them a hemivertebrate when the vertebra is less uh, well formed or it's just half its size, hence the word hemi. Um, what problems it can cause? Honestly, most of the frangies with hemivertebrae don't have a problem directly related to that. So they're born with a hemivertebrae. And there is a study out there that say most frangies, even with hemivertebrae, do not have a neurologic deficit associated with that hemivertebrae. But we do worry that this causes some um, changes in their biomechanics, so some domino effect. Maybe if the back is in general a little bit less strongly built, kind of down the road causes more stress on the discs, and this is why they degenerate and they rupture out. Um, so that's a theory, definitely. And uh, um, the disc prolapses, are they always because of IVDD, or can the healthy disc rupture as well? And I think that's actually a great question. So. The herniated disc, what we know commonly from Frenchies and from similar breeds like this, are usually because they degenerate, so because they have IVDD. When a healthy disc ruptures, we actually cause, call that an acute traumatic disc. So it definitely happens. It is usually more common either when there was a trauma, like, you know, they fell forward in the car because there was a car accident and they had like a traumatic impact to their spine or it actually very commonly happened to young sporty large breeds. So it's an acute non-compressive nucleus corposive extrusion. It's a healthy disc, it's a traumatic disc. Um, so there was no degeneration, but just the forces of the two vertebrae onto each other was too large and this is why the disc ruptures out. Um, so that's typically the reason for it. And then the four, um, but obviously that's not the degeneration prior. So the degenerative discs that can rupture out even sleeping in the crate or just, you know, being excited because mom and dad came home from work and you, they, they wiggle a little bit and they did the normal activities and why they rupture. What could breeders do to reduce the, um, the incidence or to improve welfare of that breed? And that's actually a, um, a great question because obviously the whole, veterinary medicine in general is trying to improve health by trying to avoid breeding pets with uh, IVDD. And I think that's as far as we got right now, probably the best we got of knowing, okay, this mom or this dead dog, this dam or the sire um, um, has had slip discs in the past, we should probably not breed him. So once a dog has had a slip disc and has maybe even had surgery for it, maybe it's time to get that animal neutered and take him out of the breeding program, similar for uh, the females to get them spayed to try and avoid to pass that gene on to the next generation. Here's another question. I actually love that we got even an image of, uh, of uh, this little Frenchie boy. So it says, my guy has all the things. I'm mostly curious about hydrocephalus and aging dogs. And, uh, um, he has hydrocephalus and 70% loss of spinal cord parenchyma. So it is actually, I think, a very important point um, he has brought up here. So like we said, we made this differential list and we always list the most common to the least common. But it just proves the point that hydrocephalus in all the dogs absolutely can happen. So it doesn't mean because most dogs have meningitis or brain tumor that all of them have it, you know? So this is exactly why we recommend the MRI scan to be thorough and to not miss out those two, 3% of dogs which don't have the, the most common things. So usually hydrocephalus in all the dogs is um, usually because we have a loss of tissue. So the brain is compensating by improve, uh, like increasing the amount of fluid production. So we have more CSF to fill up space which has to be filled. So within the skull, if the brain atrophies, for example, in Alzheimer's disease, so it's called canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome, the brain atrophies. And this is why it's the re remainder of the space is filled up with fluid or um, similar conditions, you know, where we had, let's say a big stroke in some of the brain tissue, unfortunately has died off. So it has been replaced with, um, with fluid. 
Hydrocephalus is usually the name for when there's increased fluid within the brain. Obviously, when the spinal cord parenchyma is being lost, you know, we call it usually syringomyelia, so the increase of fluid within the spinal cord. And this can also have multiple reasons, some of them, for example, being the Chiari like malformation, which is obviously another huge um, um, topic. And hence also the clinical signs like the head tilt, the prensing gait. This is all usually um, a sign of a back part of the brain, so cerebellar and um, um, cerebellar medullary junction type um, um, conditions. Unfortunately, this poor guy also slipped the disc about four months ago, but he got lucky with rest and medications. He has done wonders and he got back to normal. So I would definitely give the same advice Omeprazole is great. It is uh, good for stomach protection and lowers the fluid production within the brain and the spinal cord. So keep omeprazole on board. And uh, to strengthen his hind end actually is um, two aspects. One, avoid high impact activity. No jumping up and down couches, no rough housing or first big games in the backyard. And then the other part is actually physical therapy. So it's a controlled fashion, how we rebuild muscle mass and how we strengthen the back and the back muscles and the hind limb muscles. So physical rehabilitation is a big um, part of it. Gabapentin is great if he needs that for pain management. I think it's, so it's personally one of my favorite medications for that kind of conditions. Perfect. Oh, we have some more questions. So um, one of the questions here was, um, my doc had two spinal surgeries this year because of IVDD. What are your thoughts on back braces? Um, do they really help? And I actually thank you for that question. Um, that's actually a very common question I get um, from, from owners. So unfortunately, a dog which had, so French in particular, which had a slip disc in any point in time, is now considered having IVDD, and they have a 15% chance of re-rupturing a new slip disc anywhere else along their back or neck. So this is um, probably why this uh, poor little dog had two spinal surgeries, probably ruptured one disc, had successful surgery, recovered, and then was this 15% of dogs which re-rupture a disc anywhere else. Um, so I think it's great that we got taken care of this dog twice. It's obviously perfect to regain um, the ability to walk twice. Back braces in general are not my favorite because I feel like a back brace is temporarily maybe stabilizing the back, but it atrophies the muscles surrounding the back. And the, those back muscles are our, per, uh, like the natural brace, are the, the, the structure which holds the back the strongest together. So I would rather focus on physical rehabilitation to increase back muscle strength because the back brace will help while it's on, but when we take it off, we also lost that um, natural muscle stability surrounding. So I, th I fear that this will cause even further instability down the line. Can you talk about canine cognitive dysfunction treatment in elderly Frenchies? Yeah, so canine cognitive dysfunction is um, the dog version of human Alzheimer's disease. And actually, uh, should optimally be diagnosed via MRI scans. So dementia or decline in mentation can sometimes be misinterpreted in, uh, in pets just because let's say they're painful so they withdraw themselves or they have gastrointestinal problems so they don't want to participate or they have any other conditions which may look like keen and cognitive dysfunction. So I think that's the very first most important aspect. We don't uh, classify dogs of having Alzheimer's just based on clinical sign suspicion. Once you have diagnosed that, and we know it is actually Alzheimer condition, we uh, treat them initially with environmental enrichment, with uh, keeping a routine, with uh, um, first natural products like antioxidants and vitamin supplements and ginkgo supplements. And if uh, those things do not um, anymore lead to a significant improvement of signs, we then reach out to the more stronger um, serotonin uptake inhibitors and other um, like um, mood enhancers. So zelegilin is one of them, trazodone is one of them. I often even start dogs on gabapentin because I feel like it can help them a little bit. Um, some dogs can't sleep at night because they have the uh, reverse being awake at night and being asleep during the day. So melatonin as a natural product can even help um, with those um, but before I would reach out to zelegilin or trazodone, I would first try um, some more natural ways and some just getting them stimulated mentally. 
Then there's another question. It's called um, horizontal head tremor with the ability to respond to voice and visual. Showing your uh, in in the video, it's very true. What are your differentials and uh, um, are they responsive that you can snap them out? Head tremor. This occurred twice over the, a year part in a Frenchie, which is super young, two and a half years of age. So usually the horizontal head tremors like we call them uh, head tremors, actually, as a, even as a clinical diagnosis. Um, when owners can snap them out, there's very commonly that they have what we call idiopathic head tremor syndrome, very common in English bulldogs, in French bulldogs, in boxers, and actually in Dobermans. So there's other common breeds which have those. Um, and this is a more as a, like, almost like a movement disorder. So this is usually not being treated because we can just snap them out, which I also would encourage you to just um, snap him out of it. Sometimes it can be associated with medication. So I've seen this a handful of times on dogs with, uh, for example, getting tramadol. So we obviously want to stop that. It can technically be the beginning of a seizure disorder or a cerebellar disorder. So if it would progress and happen more frequent or especially if uh, your Frenchie shows signs in between those tremors and you say, okay, now he's inappropriately acting in between, we should reconsider um, diagnosing him properly, meaning with an MRI scan and possibly a spinal fluid analysis as well. But as long as he's responsive and snapping out, we can relatively safely assume he has idiopathic head tremor syndrome, which is a, a condition well recognized in bulldog breeds. And then we have uh, two more questions. One is, uh, my friend, she's one year and seven months old, the sweetest girl. I agree, they most are. Um, what age do most Frenchies show symptoms? And uh, unfortunately, I would already start getting, like ready, so maybe wrong to say, but I do see young Frenchies. I have one or two year old Frenchies with a slip disc that come suddenly paralyzed. You know, I've done surgeries on, on dogs that are young, even younger than that. But reaching almost two years of age, unfortunately, young Frenchies can have things like meningitis. It's usually anyway a younger dog's problem. So between two years and seven years of age. Um, slip discs, I want to say maybe probably five to 10 years of age. But not everything fits that category. And we had plenty of two-year-old Frenchies with herniated disc and being paralyzed, needing emergency surgery. So um, it's good to have an eye on that for sure and to be aware and ready to um, observe those symptoms. And then the other question is, my French is paralyzed in the, in the back limbs. He uh, was on a watch for myelomalacia, and uh, it's been now seven days. Can it happen years down the road, or is it just after the surgery and injury? So myelomalacia for um, basically the other owners here is usually the medical terminology for a necrosis of the spinal cord. So it's kind of, um, there's an injury to the spinal cord, it causes severe bruising, and this bruising causes an inflammatory reaction because the body's trying to heal. And then the bruising spreads out and becomes bigger and bigger. And then the more we affect the neighboring parts of the spinal cord, the more inflammatory reaction. And then it's almost like a domino effect, how it affects more and more and more of the spinal cord. And if this was, let's say it starts in his mid back and it slowly affects the spinal cord, more to the front and it affects the spinal cord overlying the chest cavity, then we have that problem that we need the chest, the spinal cord of the chest to breathe. So the nerves which come out from there innovate the, the uh, chest to move in and out. It innovates the, in, from the cervical spinal cord, the uh, diaphragm so th that we can actually breathe. So once the bruising has affected spinal cord overlying the chest and the back part of the neck, this is usually when we have a life-threatening problem because this animal would be unable to breathe if he wouldn't obviously interfere prior to that. So myelomalacia is a progressive development of a severe spinal cord injury, which can be fatal. It usually happens only for the first seven to maximum 10 days um, after the injury. So we have an acute onset, an impact to the spinal cord, and then we have that worry for the first seven to 10 days, the development of myelomalacia. If, uh, if um, we are out of that window, we are usually within the green area and we say, okay, we survived that severe condition. Usually happens to dogs a category four and five of a very sudden onset. So was able to walk in the morning and in the afternoon, 
um, the owner found the dog unable to walk. They're present in the evening here to us. They're category four or five. This is usually when I introduce the worry about myelomalacia for the first seven to 10 days after that injury. And then we have uh, another question. What rate of fringes have you seen to get refractory idiopathic epilepsy? So unfortunately lost his frangie, um to a combination of medications. Um, so idiopathic epilepsy is a genetic condition of having seizures without a direct underlying cause. So genetically, a different seizure threshold. So those fringes have seizures just because genetically they're prone to have them. In general, we actually have from all dogs having, refract having epilepsy, 30% are refractory. And what does it mean refractory? Is usually when they are on two anti-seizure medications at an adequate level, meaning at a good dose, given religiously by the owners, measured at the blood level that we know the drug is on board as it should be. And still with at least those two medications on board, we have breakthrough seizures to an unacceptable often frequency to, you know, every week still, or every week five or six clusters. So that's usually considered refractory. And unfortunately, 30% of dogs have refractory epilepsy. What we do usually is we add more medications, we increase the doses, as long as um, there are obviously many seizure medications out. And there are some dogs that need to be on four or five anti-seizure medication. And then there are cluster management. So there are on medications, also maintenance long-term every day at the scheduled time, but also on medications just in the event of a seizure to break apart those clusters and to break apart um, the seizures from recurring within that 24 hours period. And then the important point is actually here, it's one, job of ours to try and get them in a better seizure control. So the realistic goal is to decrease the frequency and severity. It is not realistic to think that with seizure meds, we can stop them all. We can just make them less frequent, less severe. And then the more seizure medications dogs are on, the more likely we have a problem affecting the organs who need to metabolize those medications, like the liver, like the kidney, like the pancreas. So typically, Every four to six months, we need to run comprehensive blood work. And if we see that one of the organs is starting to be affected, we need to treat that organ. We may switch medications around because some organs can tolerate them. So it is a challenge in that we try to find a happy medium between seizure control, frequency of administration of medications, and obviously the tolerance of the dog's own organs to handle them. Um, so there's another question. Um, what are you doing with fringes that have severe abnormalities in the spine and have neurologic deficits? So do we fix that with fixation decompression? So, and sometimes we face that, that the fringe has a malformation, has a kyphotic posture, has a hemivertebra, has scoliosis even. So the, the spinal cord is not aligned how it should be, but the fringe lives five, six, seven years just fine with that abnormality. And then exactly within that most abnormal shape um, vertebrae, he slips a disc. So then obviously we come to the disc itself may not be a huge problem and the malformation itself may not be a problem either, but the combination of the two of them kind of makes it then clinically to be a problem, even to an extent of being paralyzed. So, so in that case, unfortunately, yes, we have to um, then plan for the biggest surgery. We have to decompress the disc. We have to stabilize the spine and fix it basically with implants. It's obviously a more involved surgery than a slip disc surgery where there are no abnormalities. I wouldn't though do surgery on an abnormality without any clinical signs. So if Frenchy, which let's say has weak reflexes in the pelvic limbs and has a um, L4-5 slip disc, obviously clinically and anatomically makes sense that this is the problem. And if I have hemivertebrae at T10-11, I would leave them alone because they're clinically not right now causing a problem based on my neuro exam. And um, we may cause more harm putting implants into that if there otherwise is no clinical problem to it. So definitely clinically normal abnormalities, I would, I would never fix surgically. But if they become clinically a problem, then yes, like for example, an SOP plate is perfect because we can model those uh, implants perfectly to the spinal cord of which may be torn to the left and right and around um, the corner and, and up and down. However, 
the fringes, they have like all kinds of um, S shapes in their backs sometimes. And I have another question here. How soon after surgery do I feel comfortable with beginning some light range of motion in PT? Um, so this uh, girl had a, a T10, 11, 12 surgery with some minor spinal cord bruising and uh, um, has a weak uh, pelvic limb uh, sur um, function. So physical rehab, I think, has become more and more um, important. And I actually am an absolute favor for it. But I like the red light range of motion in PT. So I wouldn't right after surgery take this dog into the pool, you know, or go for like um, um, some increased uh, strength of physical rehab. But every single patient of mine here is having on the day of surgery some laser, some tense unit to just um, icing of the incision, more like a pain management type of physical rehab. And then on day two and three, I start with a uh, passive range of motion because I feel like the longer we leave those limbs un, un, without any motions, the stiffer they become. So movement is important, but passive. So they get little bicycle movements to the limbs, flexion and extensions of all the joints. We massage their, their muscles that they stay basically lubricated and, and well. And then once it's usually after like two weeks, usually post-op, this is when I'm in favor of getting them into more active rehab. So assisted standing, um, more like climbing over obstacles, getting some proprioceptive work in. And some dogs even need a treadmill or hydrotherapy. So that's usually the time after I removed my sutures two weeks later where we get into more aggressive physical rehab. Important obviously with uh, supervision. So in an optimal world with uh, physical rehab specialists, we usually provide handouts for what we can do at home, like some at-home exercises, which I usually encourage. I think the sooner we start with passive PT, the faster the recovery and the more complete the recovery. Also because we avoid the loss of muscle mass while I prescribe them strict, strict cage rest, so they are not allowed to do anything, but yet I want them to be strong and able to walk when the spinal cord has healed out. And I think that's the perfect medium um, of keeping muscles strong and present while still being on a strict bed rest. Perfect. Is there mm -hmm. any other questions I can send to a Q&A? Yeah, absolutely. So if you have any other questions, just send it to our email. There's a Q&A at scvneurology.com and I'm very happy to answer them. Um, if you have a Frenchie and you're curious and maybe just wondering, you know, whether or not this is a sign or not, you know, so, obviously either contact your primary care, they can get in contact with us or call us here at the office. And I believe in the end of the screen, I may have, I can share this once more with you. Um, we have three hospitals, which um, obviously all of them uh, are happy to take your phone call and you answer your questions. I work myself here in Miami, but we have a Boynton Beach location and a Jupiter location as well. So um, hope I presentation helped you a little bit and I provided you some more insights.